Well, hello everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine, and this is your Rattlecast for Tuesday, December 17th. Thanks so much for joining us. I um, hope you have a nice weekend and a nice week going forward. Uh, today we have an excellent show for you. We have uh, Peter E. Murphy, a great poet and a great teacher. He'll be joining us in just a little bit, uh, but first we're going to do a couple uh, prologue poems. And I wanted to let everybody know before we start that I'm going to switch up the uh, format once again. We're going to start right at, right at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, we did this whole pre-show thing because I wanted to check out where people were joining in and how that was working and, and whether or not people were coming in for the early poems or if they were uh, just coming for the guest. And really the, the view time, live at least, is um, consistent throughout the show. So I think we'll just uh, start right at 6 to kind of make it easier. There's really no point doing a pre-show. We'll do a little warm-up poem like that, um, maybe two, and then we'll bring in the guest at about 9, 10 Eastern. will be the new format starting next time. So um, be ready for that. Just didn't want you to show up 15 minutes early and sit around twiddling your thumbs waiting for me. The next show won't be until um, January 17th. Or no, January, what was it, 7th? Yeah, January 7th. Because um, we're going to take a couple weeks off for Christmas and uh, New Year's Eve. We don't want to have Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve shows. Uh, I think my kids would be very upset if I did that. So... Um, to start out and make sure everything's working, uh, kick back and relax, get a drink, and um, get ready to enjoy some poetry. We're going to start with, uh, I thought we'd do a few poems by Abby E. Murray to start off. Abby is one of the stars of our, um, of our Poets Response series. She's, been, she's appeared in Poets Response six times, including just a couple weeks ago. And um, she's one of those poets who submits pretty regularly, so I always love seeing her uh, her poems and what she's doing talking about current events. Um, and I thought we'd do a few of her poems in a row just to kind of put them together and see, see how she's responding to the news. I thought that'd be a fun way to start. So um, let's go over here to the... Uh, to the old internet. This is rattle.com. And um, we're going to start off with this poem by Abby... Uh, poem for my daughter before the march. This is one of the most popular poems um, in the Poets Response series. It has um, 3.6 thousand people have shared this uh, poem, and it was right after it's the New Year's Day, or you know, shortly after um, Trump's inauguration, and um, everybody was marching at that time. I first met Abby uh, back in it must have been 2011, maybe 2012. And I was visiting as a guest at Maria Gillen's um, creative writing program at SUNY Binghamton. And Abby was there with her daughter, who was about six months old at the time. Such an adorable little girl. And um, here she is, a little older now, uh, two years ago. This is Poem for My Daughter Before the March. Poem for My Daughter Before the March. When your father says he doesn't want me to march, what he really means is he doesn't want you to march. He doesn't want me to march because you will follow. He doesn't want you to march by default on my shoulders because you might follow the songs of women by default on my shoulders, raised on bread and justice. Daughter, the songs of women are the first words of children raised on bread and justice. Blessed are the ones who sing the first words of children. This is how I love you. Blessed are the ones who say they follow songs into the street. So that was Abby E. Murray from January 19th, 2017, uh, with her poem, For My Daughter Before the March. Um, see, Abby E. Murray is um, the current poet laureate of the city of Tacoma, Washington, and she's originally from the Pacific Northwest. She's moved around the country and taught writing at Col in Colorado, Georgia, Alaska, New York, and Washington. Her first book just came out this year, Hail and Farewell, which won the 2019 Prugia Press Poetry Prize and was released this September. Uh, we have eight more minutes to, um, to we get to our, our guest for today. And uh, let's try, let's check in with another poem. This is a poem, um, again, this was uh, the fall of 2017. 
um, right around Thanksgiving time. So we sort of have a holiday feel for some of these poems, or at least this time of the year, anyway. And this is Abby reading uh, What I Didn't Say at the Table, which might be um, a, some good advice for, uh, for the holidays coming up. What I Didn't Say at the Table. I'm thankful for my pussy, my lady handle, my dainty doorbell. I'm thankful for folks who say it will be fine, who tell me to try empathy, cousins who want me to shake my chances over history's fire. I'm thankful for smoke because it means something's in the oven. I'm thankful for my hair, which isn't mine, and my rings, which aren't mine. I'm thankful for the rods and cones buried deep behind my pupils, my color antennae, my flags that snap in the wind of whiteness. I'm thankful for the ocean and its quiet denouement. I'm thankful for the river that swallowed up Ceylon. I'm thankful for starlight because the moon won't smile. I'm thankful for dampness and mushrooms and mold. I'm thankful for wishbones that grant nothing. I'm thankful for fat kings and fat presidents who inspire me to drink sherry and port the way dogs eat towels, making it last. Drink rum the way death comes back for the win. A tremendous toast, a huge lump of ice. Listen up, fat kings. I've come for my briefcase. I've come for my handshake. This is empathy. This is me hiding words under the bridges under my tongue. This year, I'm thankful for street lamps and spray paint. This year, I'm thankful for my body in pieces. The middle finger, the bitch face, the frozen shoulder. And once again, that was Abby E. Murray reading What I Didn't Say at the dinner table from thanks or well, I didn't say at the table from Thanksgiving 2017. Now let's move ahead to um, another poem we did this year. This was May 7th, 2019. This is a very interesting poem called Free Shipping. We had a little bit of fun with the audio on this one. So I uh, hope you enjoy this. And especially if you can uh, read along at home, I'll read you the note. This was, um, this is what the poem was about. Someone toppled burned and drowned hundreds of thousands of bees in Texas. And New York Times headline read, There Goes My Honey Flow. It made me think about how our reactions to nonstop news stories centered on loss are wildly different, creating what feels like an even wider distance between all of us. I didn't think of honey or even pollination when I first heard about this, but the way it must feel to be drowned in a sinking structure you cannot escape, like a beehive thrown in a pond or a sinking ship or a burning democracy, Every day I peer into the news, feeling certain I can hear it all, hold it all, that I must, but where can I keep it? I don't write concrete poems often, but I want this poem to be a container for the news of honeybees burning, a fantastic, tragic image. And so this is one where if you're only listening, you can't fully appreciate it, but you kind of can. And like I said, we had some fun with the audio, so give this one a listen. This is Free Shipping by Abby E. Murray. Free Shipping. The doorbell wakes you. More deliveries. The boxes open easily each time, and you ask, who would do such a thing? Your porch sags under the glory of a mosque, a desk once used as a shield, slabs of missing ice. You don't have to keep all this. You could send it back. Down the street, a neighbor drags her unopened package to the curb and waves. Honeybees on fire. Honeybees on fire. That was free shipping by Abby E. Murray. And if you couldn't, uh, you know, if you're just listening, the, the poem, it's a concrete poem where the text is written in a box around... Um, thousands of honeybees on fire, the phrase honeybees on fire. So it's a concrete poem. Um, And let's do one last poem by Abby. We have uh, four minutes left. Uh, The next one is uh, the poem from from just just, uh, nine days ago. This is Advent on South Hill by Abby E. Murray. Advent on South Hill. When I can't tell if the sun is technically up, or gone, I walk the loop of my neighborhood, embracing it with footprints. We dread the dark here, though there's light from some lampposts and maple leaves reminiscing how brilliant they were before they dried and thickened in our gutters. 
I miss what is lit from within. I wish I could say there are goldfinches here, even in winter, and maybe there are. I haven't seen one, but the bird book says they nest in Washington year-round, molting from gilded to woolly gray suits at the end of summer. I wish I could find something weightless or buoyant to hold. When it gets cold, Finches ditch what dazzles us in favor of feathers grown solely to keep them alive. A coat the color of waiting, of slush, of sleeping and waking and pacing. My neighbors say little and close their blinds so they don't have to watch the day end with me on the sidewalk. Nobody they know or want to see my hands empty, my face not quite like one they'd remember. Mornings, we glance at each other the way I squint at sparrows, as if to check the difference between what I have and what I need to see. Something stale as getting by, or a gift in disguise. A song about to burst from trampled weeds just one note brighter than yellow. So that was Abby E. Murray reading her poem Advent on South Hill from just a couple weeks ago. And I just thought it would be fun to um, sort of show four poems by one poet, all from Poets Respond. If you're not familiar with that series, it's something that we do every week. You can uh, submit poems based on current events, uh, hopefully linked to actual news stories so we can all sort of learn about the news and uh, poetry's reaction to the news. And uh, those four poems really show sort of the creative ways that you can do it, especially if you do it really regularly like uh, Abby does. So I hope everybody who's listening uh, tries to participate and uh, write some some Poets Respond poems. Now it's uh, 5.59. I'm going to put up the uh, bumper music and it's the splash screen, and we will uh, give Peter E. Murphy a really quick call. Um, so uh, go take a little short break. I'll be back in one minute with... Uh, Peter E. Murphy. See you in a minute. So I have Peter E. Murphy on the line. Um, Peter E. Murphy, uh, I like this bio best, so let me read this one. Um, Peter E. Murphy was born in Wales and grew up in New York City, where he operated heavy equipment, managed a nightclub, and drove a taxi. He's the author of 10 books and chapbooks of poetry and prose, including The Man Who Never Was and Atlantic City Lives. Um, Looking for Thelma, an excerpt of his memoir in progress, was the winner of the 2018 Wilt nonfiction book chapbook prize. Uh, he's also the founder of Murphy Writing of Stockton University. He's received dozens of awards and fellowships and has led hundreds of workshops for writers and teachers. And um, here he is, Peter E. Murphy. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? Good. Hi, Tim. Yeah. Good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah, really my pleasure. Um, and, and you're, um, and you're in, uh, near Stockton University in New Jersey, right? Right. It's just um, outside of Atlantic City. And uh-huh. In fact, I'm, I live down the road from Atlantic City, so I'm right on the ocean, this ocean. I know you're closer to the other <laughs> one. Yeah, yeah. We, um, 
Oh, hang on a second. Let me adjust your your video here. Yeah, we uh, we published that poem, um, Atlantic City, that you wrote. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah one yeah. of them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have a whole bunch. You have a whole whole chapbook full of poems on. Atlantic yeah, City. and that one's in there. That was uh, Labor Day, Atlantic City, as I mm -hmm. recall. Yeah. 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 It was. Um, to start out, I was kind of wondering um, why you've you've written uh, ten books. Um, why chapbooks? Um, how come the last few books have been chapbooks instead of full length? Well, actually, it's now 11. It's, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, you know, you turn around, there's another one. Um, you know, what I do is um, I have a strange um, process. I like to challenge myself, and I like to give myself um, certain uh, paradigms. So one of them is uh, lately I've been writing in a series of 19 poems. Um, and 19 seems like a, a very good number because it's not like three or four. And it's not like a hundred. Mm -hmm. And um, I usually need some kind of a theme when I do that. So um, when I do these, I start sending the poems out individually. And then um, when most of them get published, I thought, okay, well, let me just send it out as a chapbook. And I find that uh, rewarding because um, there are micro presses that publish most of these. They're small, the small circulation. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's rewarding in that sense. Um, I think I, I do think it's time for me to have another full length book. It's been about 14 years since I did the last full length book. Oh, really? Has uh, it been that long? Huh. Yeah, the first one. Yeah. So I published my first book at the age of 54 um, after, you know, writing for probably 40 years. Um, and then um, they, they keep coming like this. But I think I'm ready to, uh, you know, have a, a look at a, a larger palette, more mm -hmm. or less. So that's what I think I'm going to head for. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I love the chapbook format. And the, and the reason why, I've always felt that um, chapbooks just are great for writing around a theme. Like, it's a perfectly digestible size for a book of poems. And um, I've always felt like people, instead of sort of taking advantage of what a chapbook has to offer, they use it sort of as a stepping stone. So once you write a few chapbooks, then you have a full-length book. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really cool to see you um, you do chapbooks even after you've, you've written in full length. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's also, this is, uh, probably shouldn't say this, but it's also good for people with short attention spans like myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I look at a full length book, oh my goodness, I, I want to read it and then I sort of, uh, you know, fall asleep or fade out. Mm -hmm. And it's not the poets <laughs> or the book, it's me. Uh, but a chapbook is um, more user friendly. Mm -hmm. um, I still fall asleep, but, you know, I usually get to a half of it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> rather than the third. <laughs> well, you have, uh, you have two chapbooks here um, to read from. Do you want to start with uh, something? Sure. Let me start from uh, the most recent one, which is called Meantime. And actually, the title poem uh, was published in, um, in Rattle mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago. But I want to start with a different poem called Doing Time, which uh, was also just published in uh, Rattle. This is on page 16. Thank you. And you have it there. And the reason I wanted this is that um, after it was published in Rattle, I re just received, uh, I got so many emails from people I didn't know uh, talking about it. Oh, that's really great to so, hear. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Not used to that. <laughs> right. Yeah. This is called Doing Time. Each week, my supervisor rejected my lesson plans because my goals and objectives were the same. When I asked him to explain the difference, he changed the subject. When asked why the syllabus makes no sense, he said, you're not being paid to think. You're being paid to deliver a curriculum. When I asked how to teach teenagers who can't read to read, he put a hand on my shoulder and with the other pointed toward the horizon, which happened to be the men's room at the end of the corridor, and said, take them where they are. When I turned to ask what that meant, he was gone. I figured he was off to help another teacher or meet a parent, but when I saw him first in line at the lunch counter, I knew I was wrong again. I also knew I wasn't meant to teach anything important to the dark-skinned students that sat in front of me. Like them, I was meant to fail. And because I was teaching stupid kids, I figured I must be stupid too. Even if I wanted to, I'd never be promoted to supervisor like him. So I thought, screw it. And I read my kids a poem about nature, and they said, man, that's dumb. So I read them a poem about love, and they said, man, that's stupid. So I read them a poem about sports, and they said, man, that's nice. Then I read them a poem about death, and they said, man, that's deep. Then I read them a poem that said something about their lives they didn't know they knew. And they said, let me hold that, pulling it from my hands, reading it over and over, until they said, why ain't nobody ever told us this shit before? And I said, you've got to be careful. If they know how much you really know, instead of more schools, they'll build more prisons to teach you a lesson. And yeah, that's such a great poem and um, such a such a um, big topic too. Um, you know, just the education system. I know you teach a lot. Um, do you, how how long did you teach in uh, public schools? 
I taught for 29 years uh, in Atlantic City, and mm-hmm. it's an urban school. And um, uh, it was wonderful and horrible at the same time. The kids were terrific, but, uh, you know, I, w- I was assaulted five times where I wound up in the emergency room or, oh, the, wow. uh, yeah, wow. uh, or, or being hospitalized. And it was always never by students I knew. In fact, when it, whenever it happened, one of my students said, who, who did that? We'll get them. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, but it was usually there were civil disturbances, uh, riots or breaking up fights and stuff. Mm-hmm. But it usually happened when the administration wasn't doing their job so that, um, you know, if they enforced the rules, then kids would know they had an excuse not to not to fight or something like that. But when the rules weren't being enforced, you know, it became chaos. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, uh, it's still something. And that's where I learned to teach. Um, you know, from teaching, uh, you know, kids that, you know, didn't want to learn or didn't know how to learn. And they taught me how to teach them. So I, I value that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, before we read a couple more poems, let me just say, um, you know, people already have the drill a little bit here. But um, but if you have any questions for Peter E. Murphy, just leave them in the chat window and I'll pass them along later. Um, also, please do click the like button and share and make sure you subscribe no matter where you're listening or watching this, because that's really helpful, helping um, stuff spread around uh, the Internet, especially uh, poetry that's good stuff rather than... Um, arguing and, and fighting, which is bad stuff. Um, so, uh, so do you want to read a few more, more poems, Peter? Sure. Yeah, let me read another poem um, from this book. It's, um, it's a poem that was a very powerful poem. I didn't know it was powerful. Are you familiar with the uh, Geraldine R. Dodge Poetry Festival? I am. It's, I've never uh, been, but it, I've heard yeah, it's the best poetry festival in the world. It, it's amazing. It's, it's the largest one in the Western Hemisphere, and it's held every other year. I was reading, uh, fortunate enough to read the last time, which was a year ago, October, And I read this poem, um, which refers to a bomb going off. And uh, we walked outside of the place, and there was smoke coming up from one of the manholes. Uh, We thought a bomb had gone off. It turned out to be some sort of an explosion, but uh, people blamed it on me. Um, So this is called This Time. Bombs are going off all over the city. First this street, then that street. And soon, I begin to think there are more bombs than streets. This is how terror works. It wants me to believe the man slicing lamb in the kebab shop is planning to slice me. It wants me to believe thousands and thousands are cheering on rooftops. Tara doesn't want me to know I'm more likely to be crushed by a truck as I walk home from work. More likely to be shot by the gun my wife keeps cocked under her pillow. What I don't understand is how living in this country makes me exceptional. What I don't understand is how anyone can say God tells them to kill. I want to go to the ocean. I want to forget everything I know. I want the water to refresh my sweltering body. I want to swim out past the salty horizon and not let the waves roll me back to terra firma where terrorists have tripwired the sand. Listen, what I'm trying to say is thank God they didn't think to blow up a church in Birmingham or a federal building in Oklahoma. Thank God they didn't think to blow up the heartland, the salt of the earth, the middle of this country that doesn't trust its coasts. Thank God they don't know how much we already fear each other. I think that was This Time from uh, Peter E. Murphy's new chapbook, um, Meantime. And can you, before you read one more poem, um, can you uh, explain what the titles are? The, you know, it's mean time and then this time. Everything has is yeah. time. So what's the, the yep. theme that kind of, how does that work? Well, um, I think that started actually with the poem Mean Time, which I'll read in a moment or two. That was actually published. Was, um, I started thinking about the language. And I have a friend um, when her son, who's now probably 30, when he was uh, maybe an infant, and she said uh, in the meantime, and he freaked out, no, mommy, not mean time. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Um, I, I started thinking about that, and um, uh, I just started writing all of these cliches about time um, and just made a whole list of maybe 30 or 40 of them and just say, let me use this as, again, I, I, need a, I need structure. Let me see how many of these I can write. So most of them didn't work out. I didn't get 19 in this chapbook that survived. They probably wrote 30 or 40, but you know, I think there might be a 12 or 13 here. Mm-hmm. But um, I just like uh, what connects them. And, and the title poem, Meantime, um, I just thought is so rich. Um, So let me read that as long as I'm talking about it here. Okay, yeah. Okay. And um, I see that you you put this on uh, on your website today, the the last few lines of it. Um, Yeah, we try to try to get people to come over here live. So uh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I hope I don't freak anybody out. Um, Meantime, she asked for a pillow. I brought her a fork. 
She asked for a cigarette. I bought her a sock. She asked for a newspaper. I bought her a tea set. Is this what you mean? I said. Is this what you mean? I poured milk in the toaster. I spread jam on my head. Bring me everything, she said, pointing the fork at me, her darling boy. I hopped from couch to chair in the living room. I flew out the window as if I were a bird and landed on earth which stunk of flowers, not dirt. Forgive me, the sea breaching the walls of our house, the chimney crumbling, the bedclothes on fire. It was the only way I knew how to love her. And that was... I have a lot of mother issues, and uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, most of this is actually biographical. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, one of the uh, David Cook, who uh, seems to know like every poet really well, he's here a lot. Um, he says your mother died when he, uh, since your mother died when you were seven. Um, who were the women in your life that shaped you and your poetry, or if you like, how did memory, the memory of your mom, influence you? So that's kind of a perfect segue to David's question. Well, this was wonderful. Yeah. I was um, leading a workshop in Wales a few years ago, and uh, with us was a woman um, whose mother died a month before, and she apologized by saying, I'm sorry, everything, you know, I just keep writing about my mother. And I said, I'm sorry, too. I, <laughs> my mother died 60 years ago, and all I'm doing is writing about my mother. Um, it, my childhood, I thought, was normal. I didn't know what that meant. But then as I got older, I realized it wasn't normal at all. Um, when my mother died, it didn't occur to me that she was dead. I wasn't living with her at the time. My brother and I were um, removed, more or less. We were living in a different place. And I didn't see my mother maybe more than once in the year before uh, she died. So in a sense, she was already gone. Uh, and I guess I kept waiting for her to come back. Um, you know, she just went away, and now she went further away, but she'll be back. And I remember um, a, shortly after my mother died, a friend's mother died. And I thought, oh, him, that poor fellow, he doesn't have a mommy anymore. It never occurred to me I don't have a mommy. Oh, wow. <laughs> so... I've been recovering from that, I think. Uh, fortunately, I had a stepmother a few years later, and uh, she, she became a, a mother figure that, that really helped me. Uh, it wasn't always easy growing up, especially, you know, stepmother. I didn't, I didn't understand, but now that's good. I think, of course, um, the obvious thing, that the, the main women in my life these days are my wife uh, and my daughter. And my daughter has uh, been, uh, you know, become a good friend and a business partner and everything else, so I'm very grateful for that. And uh, my wife, uh, let me tell you about my wife. My wife. This is um, a great story. It's a lie. <laughs> it's called it the great lie. I was on an airplane in 1973 flying from LaGuardia to Oklahoma City. And it was a woman, I was with a woman um, who was also a poet. And we were looking forward to this time to read our poems to each other. So we're reading poems back and forth. And across the aisle is another woman who started listening in. And then I started reading my poems to her. And she said she loved poetry. <laughs> and we got married a year and a day later. Oh, wow. <laughs> And turns out she loved poetry. <laughs> she she liked, she said she liked me. So anyway, she said she'll never get in her way, and it's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. So that's my inspiration. Is she's a cheerleader, but um, you know she lets me go around and you know go away to hotels to write, which I do, and come down here and speak to people on on Skype. And she's upstairs doing a schoolwork. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm a lucky guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are. And it's funny because um, in our, in our contributor notes in the back, uh, we asked why did you start writing poetry, and a lot of people say to um, get women. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it kind of, you know, it's a joke. It's kind of funny, but it kind of works. You know, I, I met my wife yeah, through poetry. She's a poet, it. too. And, um, you know, it just kind yeah. of happens. Although, I guess any hobbies that you do um, around other people are where people meet. So uh, maybe yeah. maybe it's just and a I coincidence. Think, <laughs> and for many men, no matter what we're doing, it's always trying to meet women, too. So, I mean, yeah, that's, you know, yeah. whether, we, whether we admit it or mm -hmm. not. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah so, so what do you want to read, read next? Um, let me read um, another poem, um, and this is more political than I usually write, but it's, um, uh, I, I see with the impeachment uh, that's uh, probably going to happen tomorrow. Um, this is a poem called Watching the Crucible in the Time of Trump at Theater Newark, Cardiff. And a bit of background, I wrote this um, in May 2017, and it was in Cardiff, Wales, um, when the uh, concert, the Ariana Grande concert was uh, bombed in Manchester. And... Um, the next night, I was at this performance of The Crucible, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cast did a strange thing at the end, which I refer to here. So some of the lines in the poem are actually from The Crucible, and some are quoted from uh, or referring to the president that we have now. And, and I don't have text of that poem, right? That's not in either chat book? That's in, yeah, it's in Meantime. Oh, is it in Meantime? Okay. Yeah, if you have it there. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's on page 14. Okay, thanks. Okay. And uh, Theater Newith, of course, means new theater in English. So, watching the crucible in the time of Trump at Theater Newith, Cardiff. But it's also a kind of guzzle, um, an informal guzzle, but I tried. First of all, 
Everyone is terrified. Is she going to fly again? I hear she flies. The word lies, lies inside of flies, inside of families. A clique of good women are shackled together, away from their families because of lies. No president in history has been treated more unfairly. No president in history believed himself so wise. I said I see the devil and they believe me. I say, even the most sensible sometimes believe a lie. The extremists of opposing beliefs lie closer together than they do to their own allies. When he called the investigation a witch hunt, the congressman, congressman from Salem said that was a lie. Apocryphal, I suspect, that the Black Panthers and the KKK raged together against race unity rallies. But the true believer is a murderer, not a martyr, when he explodes himself in his desire to terrorize. They were actors playing their roles until at the curtain call they broke the fourth wall for the Manchester dead and hospitalized. The word casual and ties survive in casualties. And that was another poem from the book Meantime by Peter E. Murphy. His most latest, it's available from Moons, Moonstone Arts, or Moonstone Arts Center. Yep. So yep. MoonstoneArtsCenter.org. Yep. Um, right. Do you want to read another? Sure. Let me read from, um, um, I thought I was going to be okay. And uh, this came out from Diode Editions a couple of years ago. I'm very happy, uh, lucky, that, uh, fortunate that they did that. On page 26 is a poem called Next. And... Um, this is perhaps my most um, ambitious mother poem. <laughs> Next. My mother, my father, and Hitler walk into a bar where I'm the bartender. I'm not dead yet, so they don't recognize me. How about a Rheingold, my father asks. I'll have orange juice, says Hitler. But Rheingold, how beautiful. Next. Hitler turns to my mother, who's still deciding what she wants. If you were me, he asks. What would you have done differently? My mother, who lived through the Blitz, doesn't like to talk about it. She says, do you think I'm fat? My God, Hitler complains. You English are pathetic. Next, the sun spills in through the window, spreads itself across the bar, sees Hitler and thinks, Jesus, I thought they got rid of that guy, and slips out. Next, a huge cockroach crawls out of a crack in the wall, climbs on the stool next to my mother and says, hi, sweetie, do you come here often? My mother blushes, thinks, at least it's not Hitler. The Fuhrer is furious, demands to use the phone. Next, a pair of enormous eagles swoops in, salutes Hitler, and drags the roach out by the scruff of its, I'm not sure what you call it. My mother begins to cry. My father orders another beer. Next, a humongous dragon spewing flames in hellfire rips the front door off its hinges, knocks over chairs and tables as it spreads its wings and shits bricks of burning coal which is surprisingly aromatic. Then a projectile vomits a stream of fiery phlegm that vaporizes Hitler. Next, my mother sees me for the first time and stops weeping. You were born in the pit of this earth, she says, which is why I named you Rock. Why have I always doubted where I've come from? What does your name mean? What have any of us ever done to deserve this life? And that was next from I Thought I Was Going to Be Okay, another chapbook by Peter E. Murphy. Um, Peter, let's talk a little bit about um, just your process. Um, you, you started the uh, Murphy writing um, 25 years ago, I read. Um, yeah. So, you, so you're a big mm -hmm. workshop poet, and um, you have a book, which I don't know if we'll get to um, much, but, but there's this book. Um, first, there was Challenges for the Delusional, and then there's right. this book. Uh, I'll put it on the screen right now, More Challenges for the delusional. Right, um, the sequel. Yeah, the sequel, <laughs> um, which includes both prompts and um, poems written by really well-known poets um, after the prompts. Um, yeah. Um, so, so do you use your own prompts very much? Is that is that part of your process? Is this, you, is, know, you sort of already did. talked like about it, to, yeah. It's trying to tickle, it's like trying to tickle yourself. Um, <laughs> you know, I create these, I create lots and lots of them for the various programs, but um, I use elements, like I have a lot of lists in the poems and strange facts and um, Things like that I use, but the actual prompts I can't use them for me unless I until I figure out what they are. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, but it's, it's just a, I got into this by accident when I was teaching high school full time. Um, 
the problem that I and I'm sure many other people have is how do you find time to write? So I did what the book said. I wrote with my students, and I did that for years. But then I found that, yeah, I was writing for 14-year-olds, and that's not what I wanted. So then uh, the next thing they say is get up an hour earlier. I did that, but I was already getting up at 5.20 in the morning. And I woke up at 4.20, and nothing happened. I just fell asleep again. So in the 80s and 90s, I was fortunate enough to have a couple of residencies at artist colonies at Yaddo and a few other places. And it was so good having that month uh, at a time with, to write with no distractions that I couldn't write at home. It was impossible. It wasn't Yaddo. Um, but then um, my wonderful wife encouraged me, and so I started going away to hotels and creating my own little artist colony on weekends. Uh, and I would do it once a month. And um, she'd look at my calendar and say, you know, you don't have anything here for next month. You better make a reservation or you're going to get filled up. So I did that. And as I was doing more and more workshops for other groups, for arts councils and other groups, um, people say, well, how do you find time to write? And I said, I'm in a hotel room once a week. <laughs> and they kept saying, I wish I could go with you. I wish I could go with you. And that's where I made my mistake is um, I booked a, a slot of rooms at a, in the Cape May at a hotel down there that um, – and I was hoping I would get 15 people to come. I would lose a lot of money. Well, I had 20. And I called it the Winter Poetry Getaway. And um, the following year, um, I invited people to come back. And then people said, well, I don't write poetry. I write prose. Can I come too? So I wrote Winter Poetry. I put and prose in parentheses. They didn't like that. Um, and then I brought friends on to help lead workshops. And then it grew and it grew and it grew. So now uh, the Winter Prose and Poetry Getaway, we get about 200, 250 people every year. Now, we've grown out of Cape May. We're at uh, a place, a grand place called the um, Seaview Resort, just out of Atlantic City. So that's going to be coming up next month. And our special guests, poets Denise Duhamel and Yusuf Komanyaka, will be there. So we're excited about that. And um, so that's, uh, as I said, it was an accident. Um, and um, about five years ago, uh, when we moved to Seaview, the hotel at that time was owned by Stockton University. And they said, gee, this is wonderful. Why don't you become part of the university? I never heard of that. I never heard of a, a university taking over a private business. So we negotiated and uh, we became part. So now it's, uh, it's, we're institutionalized. That's re um, it's really cool it, to hear how organic that, that came about. Uh, you don't usually hear mm -hmm. things like that. That It was, it was a I total know, accident. I'm, I'm, <laughs> it, everything about it. And um, I was doing this all alone for the first uh, maybe close to 15 years. And I got... Uh, so much so I asked my daughter who was working in Delaware for a nonprofit if she wanted to help and I thought she'd file. So she came to work with me, she took a big pay cut and benefits cut and she really helped grow it. So that's when we started doing workshops around the, the eastern coast and uh, we do one every summer in Europe. Um, and um, so she's really helped grow it. And uh, then we took on other employees. So now there were, uh, you know, actually um, my daughter became the director when we became part of Stockton. And now she stepped down. Uh, she had a baby and is still working part time, and I'm working part time. So Murphy writing is actually being read by people who aren't Murphys, which is even even better. I get more time to write. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And did did how did you get into writing poetry in the first place? Because you mentioned you know in the you were a nightclub a manager and a taxi driver yeah. and a and a heavy equipment operator. Was it as yeah. organic as as uh, as the Murphy writing? It, it was also an accident. Yeah, it was back in the early '60s. I was in uh, probably 13 or 14, and I was in high school. And in New York City at that time, um, there was a, a transit strike that lasted about three or four weeks. And I was interested in, in folk music, uh, country music, early Bob Dylan, early Joan uh, Baez. And um, uh, we had to hitchhike to school because you couldn't get on the buses or trains. And I, I, there was this old folk song you may have heard called the uh, Ballad of Frankie and Johnny. And I, I, and I loved that song. It was really corny, but I loved it. And I was thinking, gee, the uh, mayor of New York City at that time was John Lindsay, and the head of the transit union was Mike Quill. So I wrote a parody called The Ballad of Mickey and Johnny. And I was hitchhiking to school with my friends. I recited this you know, song to them, and they liked it. So I like attention, so I did another one. It was the old uh, folk song, The Streets of Laredo. So I made my version The Streets of New York, and I read that, and they liked that. So I went through about maybe 10 or 11 uh, folk songs, and I shared them, and that was okay. But then I wrote something, and it wasn't to a folk song. It was, and I didn't know what it was. And I was, oh, no, it's a poem. I can't share that with my friends. I get beat up. Um, and then I just kept writing more of them. And getting back to the cliche about getting girls to like you, um, I would fall in love with a girl every other week. And I would write, oh, Liz, with your blonde hair. And I'd change it next week, oh, Pat, with your brown <laughs> hair. Um, and I remember one girl saying, oh, you're so sensitive. And I said, oh, I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> <laughs> I had to look it up. And then I was, okay, that's good. If, I'm, if I write poetry, girls will think I'm sensitive. <laughs> um, and then a couple of years later, when I was a senior in high school, I did something radical. I had written maybe 200 poems, all of them terrible. And then the radical thing I did is I read a poem. And I realized everything I wrote was crap. 
And that's when I realized that this is more than just something as a way to get girls to like me. This is uh, something important. <laughs> so that's that's how it happened. Yeah, well, you have a lot of fans on here watching live. Uh, Shirley, I'm just going to pass along a couple of comments. Shirley Brewer says uh, she went to your first getaway in 1998. Uh, and she's been to many. They're wonderful. And she's done great writing there. So she'll see you next month. Um, ah. Kim Tedrow says uh, she has more ch- or challenges for the delusional. And it's a great book. She didn't even know that it was yours, it sounds like. Um, <laughs> and um, let's see. And uh, Mac- Maxa60 says she's so enjoying your poems. It's Noreen in Salt Lake City. So, um, ah. um, yeah. And, and uh, Frank Beltrano's here. Alex- Alexis Ron Fancher's here. So uh, hello to everybody. Uh, if you have any questions for uh, Peter E. Murphy, uh, leave them in the chat, and I'll pass them along. Do you want to read a couple more poems, Peter? Sure. Um, let me read a, another poem or two from um, I Thought I Was Going to Be Okay. And uh, these are poems that were written um, in the early, uh, maybe 2011 or 12. And they reflect that, uh, I think, a different president at the time, a different uh, view. And it was also after the, uh, the, uh, the bubble. This first is called Good Grief. It's on page eight if you're showing it. Good grief. I wake from a nap where I dreamt I was crucified up the, upside down to find night has already fallen. Like Edison, I'm afraid of the dark. Below the slot in my front door, a pile of envelopes. A direct mail Jesus urges me to pray and donate. TransUnion wants to sell me my credit score. Facing history insists I consider my moral choices. I let my newspaper go when it misprinted control thought as control throughout. On television, a bee wrangler deconstructs why the queen is kept fat and happy at the expense of workers who produce honey. Marx might object, but didn't he say, I'm not a Marxist, Einstein, I don't believe in mathematics? Every three seconds, someone writes a poem about love. Six times an hour, a dog gets hit by a car. In 17 minutes, somebody else will be killed by a gun. It's hard to remember that Amazon used to be a river. The last time I felt this way this long, death stopped at several houses in the neighborhood to ask for something sweet. I want to believe the sun is a star and we spin around it. I want to believe I have a soul that whirls on after death. I want to believe that Marx at the Royal Buffet will go light on the soup and rice, stuffing himself instead on crab legs, pork, a heaping plate of the jumbo shrimp. I just cooked jumbo shrimp tonight. I didn't realize that was going to come up here. My, my dinner menu is, is in the poem. That's never happened. <laughs> That's great. One of the uh, things I used in my writing prompts, and I used this for myself too, is fortunes uh, from Chinese restaurant. I probably have uh, 8,900 fortunes in a little bag that I carry around. Um, so I sort of refer to that there. In the next poem, Foreclosure, which is on uh, page nine, it uh, actually quotes a, a fortune, but I, I tweaked it. It didn't actually say what it says here in the fortune, but um, I'm allowed to lie. I'm a poet. Foreclosure. Used to be I could get anything I wanted delivered to my door in 24 hours. Now my closets are full of smoke and I'm showing symptoms of anonymous fever. I hear the laugh track of adventure capitalists flaunting their new talking dogs. I lose sleep, gain weight, and confuse the death toll with the death tax. I become obsessed with the online poll to assassinate the president and the blunt force drama it inflicts on the soul. When I suffered from restless prick syndrome, I excused myself by thinking I needed more, but that was before I understood dying gracefully is a myth. After a lunch of peace and happiness noodles, I digest my paper fortune, good luck with your tumor, which would be funny if it were funny. God bless, God damn, don't let it end like this. Let me do some, forgive me, I've I've never felt better. Those are two poems from I Thought I Was Going to Be Okay. Um, so, so it feels to me like your writing process is to start with something and just play with it until, um, mm-hmm. until something cool and surprising happens. Is that how, is that, yeah. it, it, uh, what's your, what's your advice? Um, you know, the biggest problem reading submissions that I see, um, is that people sort of have a preconceived notion of what's going to happen in their poem. So it ends up being very flat and unsurprising. And, um, yeah. you know, there's that expression, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. And that's kind of how yeah. I feel reading the majority of submissions. Uh, what, what advice would you give to, um, to, to unlock that ability to surprise yourself? Because it seems like you do that in every poem is, is, is my impression of it. I, I, no, thank you for saying that. I, I really try that. Um, 
what I do in the writing of prompts that I do, and many of these are in the More Challenges book and the Challenges, um, is that I, I have crazy kind of requirements, like write a poem, let's say, about being in first grade, include a, uh, a bicycle, a movie that you saw 20 years later, and um, you know the weather or something like that. Um, or I'll have a, I have uh, thousands of postcards I use, which I use at some of the conferences, and not just look at the images from the postcards, but use some of the writing from the postcard that in your, in what you're writing, and make it make it uh, incorporate that. When I was writing most of the poem or many of these poems, and I thought it was going to be okay, um, I mentioned I write in hotels. Uh, many of the hotels give you a USA Today um, as part of it. What I would do for what I did for many of these poems is that I would read the, through the paper, looking for phrases. Some of them would be trite, some would be really interesting. And I'd write them down, maybe get 10, 15 words or phrases. And then when I was done with my coffee, I'd type them up, and that's what I would send to the poem on. Um, no idea what it was going to be about. And most of them were terrible. They didn't make it. But the ones that did, I liked it. So that was a way of surprising me because um, there's something inside of me chose those words or phrases. And what was it that made me do that? And so I think, I, I believe really trying to get the subconscious to write the poem. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what happened in many of these um, for that. Um, for the uh, the poems that I'm writing now, um, what am I writing now? I'm trying to remember what I was writing now. I haven't looked at my poems that I've been writing now since this morning. Um, oh, okay. Um, I, I've been writing poems about light and about the stars and something else like that. But I don't know anything about that stuff. I'm not a scientist. So I've been trying to ask questions um, that probably somebody smart would know, but asking them in a really um, organic way. Um, and um, the questions I hope, um, at least the, nobody's seen these yet, but how I hope they work is that they will, um, I guess, connect with them um, on an emotional level while talking about this other stuff that is ethereal. Um, so, but I always have to have a, a challenge and a theme. Something Stephen Dommins uh, had said or written years ago is that he didn't want to write the same book twice. And uh, I was so disappointed because I love some of his books uh, like Black Dog, Red Dog, and uh, Cemetery Nights. I wanted him to write more poems like that. <laughs> yeah. um, but I respect that. And so I realized I get it now. So I'm trying to make each of these little chapbooks, what I'm doing, make them very different from one another. And I don't know what it's going to be until, until it happens. Yeah, it, it's really interesting to me because I, I feel like that's that's what we're really doing with poetry. No matter who, how we're doing it, we're sort of finding a way to um, access the subconscious, like to turn mm -hmm. off the frontal lobe and let yeah. other parts of our brain speak using the linguistic systems instead of um, the usual mm -hmm. linguistic centers where we already have sort of preformed ideas. And, uh, and that's how we make connections and stuff. So it really is and the that's surprise comes from, which is, you know, how you originally started the question. That's, that's what this, uh, what comes out to surprise. Like, Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's like one, one subconsciousness talking to another is kind of what poetry mm -hmm. is. It, it, it always seems to me anyway. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Um, well, do you want to read a couple more? Maybe. Sure. Uh, Let me read, um, go back to, um, meantime. Okay. And I'll read a couple of poems that are very directly about time. Um, they're uh, origin poems. I, I think maybe a way to try to describe them. So let's see. The first one would be on page uh, two, the nick of time. I love that phrase, the nick of time. And I think that's where this pain, pain, that's where this pain came out of. This poem came out of that idea of a nick as a cut of something like that. And I remember, um, like many of these poems, I go to Wales once or twice a year, and I, I spend time just uh, secluding myself in a hotel there or someplace, and I write there. And um, I was in a village in Wales whose, this poem begins, I couldn't pronounce the name of it. I had absolutely no idea. So that's how this poem begins. The Nick of Time. I was conceived in a village whose name I could not pronounce. Two parents who turned me out once I stopped sputtering, goo goo. I slept in a field and ate horseradish and wild garlic until soldiers chased me away with their guns. Nothing makes sense, I thought, especially how we're born, how those two who never loved each other slapped their bodies together night after night. What for? When I realized the universe is broken, I coil springs to sweep hands across the face of a clock and try to live as if each day this side of the grave could be a good one. But then I lost one wife flicked open by a bayonet, a second who fled into the woods, a third dead bearing my seed. What I want is redemption I don't have to die for. I dig a plot in the earth and chisel my name into stone. Truth is, only when I lie down can I stop dreaming. Not a happy poem, but it's a, uh, it's, uh, I have sort of the autobiographical part in there along with the mystery part. And, um, you know, I said origin. So I've been, I've read a lot of poems in here about um, imaginary births 
and and um, and lies. The next one, serving time, is on page three, and um, this refers to um, the cover of the book, actually, um, "Longitude Lunatics." And um, back in the uh, 18th century, uh, the British government put out a uh, an award for 10,000 pounds for anybody who could figure out how to measure time for ships crossing the sea, and it took 40 years for somebody to do it. And uh, a number of people allegedly went crazy doing it. And the cover of the book is an image by Hogarth um, from the Rake's Progress. And this image is called um, Longitude Lunatics. Um, and you can see some of their figures in there. So that's, uh, I refer to that in here. Serving time. I was raised by a wing of dragons bearing the habits of religious sisters who smacked me when my mouth was smart and again when it was slow to learn. They force-fed me sweet potatoes, scrambled with lard to fat me up. For what oven? I was never sure. I stowed myself in the belly of a coffin ship that floated by each solstice, and again when the night and the day were the same. It drifted to an island where the sun rises above the waves and rarely sets. Oh, how I long to serve myself a slice of this syrupy evening, to handle decoys from the permanent collection, and examine the scribbling of longitude lunatics long dead. Instead, I work the gravy shift, where none of the plates are special or blue, and each diner is a narcissist with an appetite. At this table, an ensemble of latex artists. At this table, a banker and his pen. At this table, breakout leaders from a convention of choirs, where each delegate sings only the songs of himself. And that was serving time from... Uh from meantime. Um, um, Peter, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, you didn't start publishing poetry until you were 50 years old. Um, 55. I published poems early, but not as a book. Oh, not as a book. Not as a book. No, I, I, yeah. Um, no, it always eluded me. Ah, okay. Uh, so yeah. so can, you, can you describe a little bit about the climb up to being a, a sort of well-known, respected poet from, from not having any books published or anything for the first 50 years of your life? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess that um, when I, I remember being in my 20s, and I, I should publish a book by the time I'm 30. And, um, you know, I had no idea what that meant. I, I um, you know, I didn't know anything. So I put together a book linked, um, uh, a bunch of poems with no particular theme or anything else, except that they were in chronological order, and sent it out to uh, one particular contest, and it didn't get accepted. And I thought, okay, well, that's it. And I don't think I, I tried again for many years. But then I learned the process, and I learned, uh, you know, it's, it's, the, the book has to be as crafted as a poem. Um, but, um, I always felt that, um, uh, you know, the writing was important to me. I certainly would have loved to have published early and published young and be famous and get awards and be brought around the country and, you know, read at the uh, universities and, and, and find women, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if the writing didn't mean so much to me as, as to who I was, then, um, it would not, it didn't matter. And, and so that's what kept me. Um, I kept writing and, I uh, kept writing poems that, uh, pleased me. And then I write more poems, and the poems I wrote before this, okay, they weren't really that good. So good thing you didn't publish that. Mm -hmm. So um, I was grateful when it finally happened. Do you, do you remember the first poem that you ever had that sense of surprise that, you know, because I remember the first time I wrote a poem that did that, and I it that made sort of made me a poet for life. I was like, whoa, like, where'd that come from? And yeah. it, it's not even that it was a good poem. It was just something that I didn't expect at all. And I realized that that could happen. Did that, did that ever happen to you? Is there a poem it, that... It did. It did. It's actually the first poem I ever published. Um, and it was, um, it's a poem It was called Fruition. And I didn't have a title for it. I remember writing it, and it was very um, abstract, and it wasn't narrative. At the time, I think I was writing a lot of narrative poems. It was a poem just about a stillness and a trying to an awareness. And um, I was asked with a, a group of other people to read uh, poems at a halfway house for women who were coming out of recovery. Of, uh, I don't remember what kind of recovery. This was back in the early 70s. And I said, hey, gee, I don't have a title for this. If anybody has a title, I appreciate it. So I read the poem, and one said, fruition. I thought, oh, that sounds good. I didn't know what it meant. I had to look it up. And uh, it was eventually published in Commonweal. Um, in 1973, and, and I thought it was very wonderful because Commonweal published it, and they sent me a check for $7 in 1973. I was like, wow, so that's what happened. You publish a poem, and they send you a check for $7. That's great. And two or three weeks later, I got a letter from Commonweal, but it wasn't a letter. It was the envelope, and on the inside was a tear sheet from the magazine, and I opened it up, and Commonweal had been around for a while, and they were publishing their 50th anthology of 50 years of Commonweal. 
and I'm looking at this, and why did they send me this? And I say, it cost $7. I said, oh, <laughs> they want their $7 back. Very, very tricky. That is very funny. tricky. I figured, all right, I shouldn't, what right did I have to keep the $7? So I wrote a check for $7. I fold over the, the tear sheet, and on the back, I see my name is there. And they didn't send me because they went, somebody had written a letter to the editor about my poem. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Comparing it to only, you know, to Goethe, mm -hmm. to Hopkins, these other people, I didn't know who they were. And it said that this poem changed his life. And I said, oh, now I get it. You publish a poem, they send you a check for $7, and somebody will write to tell you the changes of life. So it um, never happened again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I thought that was the process. But that was a poem that I think that surprised me um, because I didn't know what it was. And I, I can't say that I understand it now even when I look back at it. Not that I, I look at it very, very often. But it was, um, it was a different kind of poem. And I think I trusted something at that time that I just sort of wrote it very sparse, there was no punctuation, maybe no capitalization, and it just felt like it was solid for some reason, even though I couldn't describe it or, or tell you what it meant. Hmm, trust is an interesting... Trust? Yeah, trust uh, is something that I don't really think about very much, but you do have to trust yourself. That's kind of the key to it all. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, um, I, I see a lot of what I'm writing and in, uh, in some of the things I'm doing is like, okay, I'm not seeing these poems in magazines. <laughs> <laughs> so either they're really bad... <laughs> Or, um, or I'm doing something that's just not being done, uh, or in a way that's not being mm -hmm. done. Of course, everything has been said, but you know, how do you say it that makes it interesting? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, you know, that's where the, where the trust comes in for. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Well, we have a few more minutes. Maybe one or two more poems. Do you want to read before we go? Sure. Alrighty. Let me see what else I got here. Um, let me go back to. Uh, I thought I was going to be okay, and I have a pair of quasi sonnets that are here. I say quasi because they're 14 lines, so, you know, that's good enough. And um, this is on page 23. It's a poem called Testimony. And uh, I didn't know what the word testimony meant and since where it came from. And uh, when I discovered that, I was just very joyful. Um, and if you don't know what it means, the poem will tell you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> It also has a time element here, which sort of preceded the writing about time, but it's at the end there. Testimony. If you were Roman and ancient, you had to put one hand on your scrotum when swearing an oath. It didn't matter that women didn't have them because women didn't matter, at least until the 20th century, or was it the 13th when the Magna Carta ponied up? The Hundred Years' War lasted 116 years. The Beatles used the word love 613 times in one song. No, it must have been in all their songs. And did you know that Marvin Gardens is spelled wrong? It's misspelled on a Monopoly board. Parker Brothers apologized, but refused to change it. Elvis was a seventh degree black belt. Hitler had only one testicle. Enough to swear by, but you shouldn't trust anything he tried to tell you. Clocks made before 1600 had only one hand. <coughs> 1660, sorry about that. Small print in this book, small print. Buyer would be alert. <laughs> So I had a lot of fun with that, um, and uh, my obsession with my mother led to an obsession with Hitler, because I'm trying to figure out, you know, over the years, well, why was my mother the way she was? Let me blame Hitler, <laughs> right? She, that's, uh, she was in Wales during the war. That's where she was born and lived, and, uh, you know, uh, that's a good, a good a reason as any. Uh, and the poem on the next page, um, Kaput, also came from the title, uh, the word Kaput. I just loved the sound of it, the onomatopoeic poetic of uh, Kaput. So this is a poem where bad things happen to good people, mostly good people. Kaput. When an eagle mistook Aeschylus' bald head for a stone, it dropped the tortoise from on high, crushing his skull. Li Po, trying to kiss the reflection of the moon in a river, fell out of his boat and drowned. Martin of Aragon succumbed from uncontrollable laughing. Ivan the Terrible had a stroke while playing chess. Thomas Merton grazed an electric fan while stepping out of his bath. Tennessee Williams choked on a bottle cap. Sherwood Anderson swallowed a toothpick. Harry Houdini had someone punch him in the stomach. Elvis, Lenny Bruce, and Jim Morrison overdosed in the bathroom, though not at the same time. Jimmy and Janice overdosed in the bedrooms. They didn't have to go. Peter, I love the double meaning of that. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks so much. Uh, Peter E. Murphy, it's been a pleasure talking to you and, and hearing some of your poems. And um, Joe Costell here says, so many of us who would not consider ourselves writers if not for Peter's, Murphy's insisting. Uh, oh. so, so, um, yeah, a great, great poet and a great teacher. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight and, uh, hope I uh, see you soon. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me yeah. on. Good night. Bye now. Yeah. So that was Peter E. Murphy. 
uh, reading. He has um, he has uh, two chapbooks that just came out pretty recently. Uh, the one he was just reading from is this uh, chapbook. I thought it was going to be okay, and that is by Diode Editions. You see Diode Editions there, and um, the other book that's just more recent, just came out this September, is Meantime, which has two poems from, from Rattle in here. And you can get that from the Moonstone Art Center at moonstoneartcenter.org. Also find more of Peter E. Murphy's work at peteremurphy.com, I believe it is. I should have uh, wrote that down. Um, let, me, let me check this really quick. Peter, I want to make sure I get it right. Yeah, peteremurphy.com. So, um, so check that out there. And um, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, during the uh, guest portion of the show, I'm going to take a little tiny break and get set up, and then we're going to do our open mic for those watching on video. Um, for those who are just listening on audio, um, on the iTunes or Stitcher or all those places, um, this will be the end of the show for tonight. But um, next week, we will be off. We'll be off for uh, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. But in three weeks, we are going to have... Barbara Crooker. Uh, that's January 7th, 9 p.m. Eastern. And once again, we're not going to do the pre-show thing. We're just going to start at 6 o'clock, do a warm-up poem, and then bring Barbara right in. So um, I'm going to take a really quick break if you're watching on video. And um, I'll be back in just a minute with the uh, open mic. But if uh, you're watching, if you're listening on iTunes or Stitcher or all those things, uh, have a good week, and I'll see you soon. Bye. Okay, we're back. Thanks so much for hanging out. Now we're going to do the open mic part of the show. Uh, I have three pre-recorded poems. Um, we have Sasha Stiles, Meredith Bergman, and um, and Joseph Faramni Igbenigbi. It's a really hard word to say. He's an African poet from uh, Nigeria, I believe. Um, he says it so fast. I tried to say it that fast, and I can't. Um, so if you would like to join in the open mic, please send a... Um, Chat message to me at Rattle Poetry over Skype. That's the first thing to do. Ignore the fact that I have Do Not Disturb on. Um, that's just so that the uh, ringtone doesn't appear on the broadcast. There's no other way to do it. You can't turn off the ringtone. Otherwise, the way the uh, new Skype app works. Um, and we also have a um, phone number you can call. Uh, let me put that up really quick. The phone number is uh, 818-850-7727. So if you'd like to call in over the phone and read a poem or talk about anything, this can be like an Ask Me Anything, any chat about poetry, anything you'd like to say. Um, call in if you'd like. If you call at the exact right time, I will um, answer. And if you call at the wrong time while a poem's going or someone else is on the line, I'll just call you back as soon as we're done. So feel free to give us a call. Once again, that number is 818 818- 850-7727. But first, let's start out with an open mic poem. Now, if you'd like to pre-record an open mic poem like this, all you have to do is go to rattle.com slash rattlecast, and you submit these over... Um, you submit these uh, through Submittable, just like any other submission, except you include an MP3 or some other audio file of the poem. So we're going to start out with uh, this terminal by Sasha Stiles. And um, let me see her note here. Uh, Sasha Stiles is a poet, writer, and artist, and creative strategist working in at the intersection of analog, nostalgia, and transhumanism. Um, her pushcart nominated poetry is here all over the place. Um, and she explores relationships between technology, language, identity, and humanity. Um, 
yeah, there's a big bio. She can find her online at Stasha, Sile, Stasha Styles. And it's spelled like you, you see here on the screen at S A S H A S T I L E S. That's Twitter, uh, if you'd like to find her there. And her poem today is Terminal. And uh, let's do that. And then we have a few people. David Cook and Sarah Brickholtz have uh, asked to be on uh, Colin over Skype. So we're going to do those in the order they were received. Thanks so much uh, to Sarah and David. But first, here is Sasha Stiles' poem, Terminal. It's been a good just for me. I'm from Nigeria. Where I... Hello. Hang on a second. That was the wrong poem. Here we go. Sasha Stiles reading Terminal. Hi, I'm Sasha Stiles, and I'm uh, reading my poem, Terminal. The cloud, like any other cloud, gathers rain. Exhausted servers hotboxing their environs. Polluted air, perfumed shroud, hangs heavy, pregnant, gray, struggles to take a full breath. Soon it will pour, not the onrush of info, but real fat drops swelling the sea. See, I do love my phone to death, till that part where I drown, tethered to personal effects. When I'm melancholy like this, it's so nice to have a toaster that talks back, to dumb down while everything around me wises up to own a microwave that really hears me. Listen, all these smart-ass devices insult the intelligence, yet I lament the inert's lack of inner life. Consider out-of-service range a kind of funeral service. Listen, I'm keening for every extinct version of myself, unborn generations already obsolesced, This plastic on-key, waterborne, will outlive us all. I'm never really offline, am I? There's always a cave mouth's worth of blue and green eyes blinking under the sideboard, fixed on us. I'm Dada's girl now, encrypted, tucked in and out of sight. But they're coming for the power plants, the pacemakers, this plaint. Fingers tapping a dirge like music. This rabbit hole I've dug feels grave. Walls sloping steeper, screen gone dim, threatening to flicker. Or is it shelter? There's just too much to know and not enough hours. There's just too much glow for a deep sleep. My heart pounds, all racing pulse, close thunder. When I reach my nightly cataclysm, when I dream of some unknown dark, I wish on a red warning light, will it to last. I clutch flesh for comfort, pray for the first time in my life, crawl under love like the security blanket it is, a privacy, a protection. This old Old world has seen more than anyone alive remembers. If these are our final moments on earth, where to next? So that was Sasha Styles. You can find her at Sasha Styles. She's reading her poem Terminal from the pre-recorded open mics. Thanks so much, Sasha. Uh, let's go to Let's see, Jeshua Corwin, uh, Sarah Bricolt. Let's, uh, I'm going to call up Sarah Bricolt. Um, she's new to the uh, first-time caller. Let's see if this works. Now, it's ringing, but um, you can't hear. Um, Sarah, I have you on the line. I'm about to pull you in. Um, I, he- I hear you. How you doing? Good. I, I don't see any video yet, so can you click on the video, the camera icon? If you if you hover your mouse, there you go. There you go. Hi. Hello. Okay, so I'm going to pull you in just one second. And um, here's our guest, uh, Sarah Bricolt. How are you doing tonight, Sarah? I'm doing all right. Okay, you are on screen and live. Um, what are you going to read for us today? So what I'm 
going to read is basically an ode to my first open mic, which this is. Oh, great. Um, I have always and I spent some time thinking about why. So this is called I've Always Been Too Afraid. Oh, hang on. Before you start, let me ask, um, where are you calling from? I am calling from Boston. Ah, okay, cool. Well, good, good to hear you from Boston. Um, okay, let's hear the poem. Okay. I've always been too afraid. One, this is my first time at one of these, and here's why. Before today, it was unknowable, a Schrodinger's box of a thing, a place where there's a community that is alive and vibrant and beautiful and accepting and celebrates all that, or it's dead. And as long as I didn't go, I could live in a world of possibility, a world where it's alive, always and forever, an imaginary world, but at least it's something. Two, when I would sit in my room and cry and write poems in tears and blood and just wish that there was some way to make the pain stop, I did nothing. Not because I didn't want help, but because it had the potential to fix everything, to make me better, to make me the person I always wanted to be. Or it would do nothing. And as long as I did nothing, as long as I sat there and drowned in my haze of pain, I didn't have to risk knowing that it wouldn't work, that my last resort had failed. Because how do you even move on from that? Instead, I could imagine that place, that fork of the future where everything was fixed. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And congratulations on your, your first open mic. That was uh, Sarah Bricolt. Thanks so much for calling in, Sarah. You're welcome. Awesome. Hope you call again. Have a good night. Good night. Okay, bye. Yeah, so that was uh, Sarah Bacup with uh, a, her first ever open mics, and congratulations to Sarah on that. Uh, let's do another. Um, let's do another pre-recorded poem. Um, this next one is by um, Igbegini Jessafaranmi, and um, from Nigeria. Uh, he teaches pharmaceutical pharmaceutical microbiology. And this is a poem about dying and aging. He wrote it for his grandmother, who is now dead. Uh, here it comes. Um, mirrors. Hello, my name is Winnegid Jesferami. I'm from Nigeria, where I am a lecturer. I take pharmaceutical microbiology at the Obafemi Awolowo University. Um, um, this poem of mine is about dying or aging. It's a process. I wrote for my grandmother, and uh, it starts with mirrors. Now my grandmother goes quiet in front of calendars at all the mirrors. At how the sin within the lanky frames always change. At how in this world our bodies are only brief, briefly pretty. Like any other child, I learned the language of departure from the way her body parts rehearse their exit. A square inch, aching with all the side effects of sleeping. I memorize the layer of wrinkles in her face, rough as they are. I imagine the other dialects of the chin, getting tired of taming the tongue and now knows it runs to taste of memory. Why else does she give me with her face? The same black holes for eyes. If not so, I'll know what I'll look like when I'm dying. My grandmother packed silence in a long syntax of size and fed it to me in a sense on a riddled mat. Some days she takes me along to funeral so I know how life is mostly a long one. How fleeting stones of days say John narrow walls onto the whittle down the desire to say. Now I spend what's left of time learning the sad mechanics of how forever works. Our culture using cyclical pills to hold our own decay to tell the body we aren't ready to disappear. Of how we come to reinvent days only to measure how long the body survived before it all discovers nostalgia. Her grandmother stays quiet in front of her mirrors. Perhaps now she knows how to use the calmness to whisper all of this loud noise into coherence, hoping that time would regard her language. And that was 
Igbenegi Jessifer on me reading Mirrors. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that. As always, the purpose of these open mics, uh, the pre-recorded version, is to allow people who can't watch live to participate. So, um, you know, if you're watching this later and, and it's, this is not a time of day that's good for you, or uh, you're, you're scared of using Skype or the phone, uh, you can always pre-record a poem and send it on over, and we'll do a couple every every episode. Let's go over to um, let's go over to David Cook. I'm going to call him up. He's a regular contributor. Great questions from David every week, and good poems too. Hey, David, can you hear me? Oh, reconnecting. The network connection is poor. Hmm. Let's see, David Cook, can you hear me? Ah, there he is. Okay, so let me pull you in just one second. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, there he is. Yeah, I, I see you. And uh, we see you and hear you. Hi, David. How's it going? It's going pretty well. How are you doing? I'm great. Having a good night. That was a good good episode with uh, Peter Peter Murphy. Uh, yeah, Peter Murphy's excellent. And uh, just a word of explanation for you. I just um, I Googled uh, Peter Murphy and in interviews with Peter Murphy so that I would have uh, <laughs> a good question to, to get get for him. So, oh, that's great. Well, that's I really, my... really appreciate it. You're, you're doing more work than I am because I just read their books really quick <laughs> while, my son, while my son's doing his jujitsu stuff uh, earlier in the day. Uh, but so so you you should host instead of me probably. Uh, so so what do you have for tonight? So uh, we have a nephrom nephromancy, and I, hopefully I can get it on screen. Hang on one second. I already pulled it over to. Um, let's see. Let's go. Can I get it here? Let's see. I have to make the screen bigger so it fits. It's kind of hard because it doesn't adjust right. Let's see. Okay, so I think. Everybody should be able to see it now. Okay, so so we have nephromancy. Okay. That's yeah. I'm. Keep... Are you Let here? me turn off the rattlecast. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If you ever call in, make sure to um, turn off your YouTube stream for two reasons. First of all, there's like a one minute or so delay, so it gets confusing yes. who's talking. And then for the second reason, you don't have as much bandwidth because um, you know stream you know, video coming down, then you have a video going up and my video coming down. So, um, so definitely turn off the window with YouTube if you're going to call in live, but I have your poem ready whenever you're, whenever you're ready, David. Oh, did it freeze? Oh, reconnecting. Let's see. David's not that good at standing still. Reconnecting. Hmm. Oh, here we go. Ah, here we go. You're back. Okay, so uh, we have you back. You have your YouTube off, and uh, I can put the poem on the screen whenever you're ready. Okay, let's let's start this. Okay, um, this poem I wrote a while ago, and it's uh, entitled Nephomancy, which is the divining of the future by looking at clouds, and um, it's got a couple of uh, a lot of my poems I are sandwiched just with a, a word that I found that um and this one has several words and I probably will mispronounce them correctly. <laughs> so here we go. Nephomancy. On your back, you can see them. Your futures like a palimpsest of clouds over a woad of sky obscured cumuliform and cuneiform, mirror tales. What do you do? Asking not with cocktail party patrony, but with a whinny of helplessness, as when you ask yourself, what do I do? Behind all the roiling glaciers of sun reaching through a cuvade of space, only to be halted by this fish-fleshed Firmament. Amatas sings. Their stilted dialogue belies the social workings before each phrase. Are you? Asked a hundred times with eyes. Withstand. 
withhold, withdraw, with childlike honesty, a similitude of courtesy, when clear eye, when clear skied, you asked, what would I do? Fate and fret locked and swelling winds gall a mare's nest of clouds. And woods blow out while wills blow in. And whether or not you need an answer, what will you do? Thank you. That was uh, uh, nephomancy, a, a new word. I've never heard that word before. So, yeah, you learn something every day. Thanks so much, David. Yep, I think it froze again. Um, but we'll just we'll just hang up and. Uh, but thanks so much, David. That was a, another excellent poem. I'm glad to see you always on the open mic. It's really nice to have repeat, uh, repeat viewers and, and open mic poets. Because um, what we're really doing here, I've been thinking about it, is kind of sitting around a campfire, sharing poems and uh, stories, which is something that has been uh, fundamental to the human experience for like a hundred thousand years, probably. And um, and uh, it's just a lot of fun to hear and, and check in with other people, especially people that we've uh, we've seen before. So thanks so much, David Cook, for uh, being here and for, for uh, utilizing Google and reading interviews and uh, asking good questions that I should be. Let's see. So we have, um, uh, let's see, who else? Oh, an incoming call. Let me answer that. Um, hello, this is Tim Green with Rattle. You're about to be in. Hang on one second. Let me uh, pull you in. Uh, here you are. So who, who's calling now? This is Carla Schwartz. Hi, Carla. Yeah, thanks for calling again. Hi. I should put you, I, I'm sure there's like an address book, so I should just be able to see your phone number and um, know it's put you. Put me in your contact. Put me in, yeah, I've put you in my contact, this number in my contact. So, <laughs> yeah, well, um, th thanks so much for calling. And you're calling from, oh gosh, do I remember? I don't. Where are you calling from? I'm actually calling you from Massachusetts from uh, Framingham, Massachusetts right now. Ah, cool. But that's not uh, where you're usually from, right? Um, well, it depends. In the summer, I live on an island in a solar-powered houseboat in Lake Winnipesaukee. Ah. So, um, so I live in different places depending on which month it is. <laughs> but um, in the winter months, I'm either in Carlisle, Massachusetts or Framingham, Massachusetts. So. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for, for calling again. What do you have for us tonight? And should I look at your Instagram page again? Well, actually, tonight um, I think I'm going to an older poem. And um, so if you Google uh, Sunlight Press and Carla Schwartz together, uh -huh. I believe you will find this poem, which is called To the Posting Facebook Users. I see it. Okay. Hang on one second. Okay. Let me get it on the screen for everybody, and, um, and then we'll get going on it. Okay. Um, it's a little tricky to get this centered right for some reason. Hang on one second. Okay. Well, the poem is actually less justified below the image, so you don't have to really show the title, and, and it should be fine. Well, I've got it. So we're, we're good to go. So this is um, our... F wait. This is to, to the posting Facebook users. Okay. Exactly. Okay. That they count themselves among the loved when they count their thumbs up and hearts. That they pretend to worry when only one friend comments, she, the one who plays farm bill and speaks smiley. That they accolades over alcoholic spewers with words like brilliant or mention authors like Kant or Nietzsche because they all have sunny vacations, loving friends, families, and pets. Because who wouldn't want to post a photo of a black, who would want to post a photo of a black eye or broken vase? Because when the shit hits the fan, a dog still smiles for the camera because they get psyched when a hero tags them if they showed up for a gig and then see all 30 comments on the post. They with 800 friends to their heroes, thousands, because every time they visit Facebook, awards, children, graduations, congratulations, 
celebrated with balloons. They wonder, should they get a spouse or pet or child or try harder? Because they feel smaller and smaller, lesser and lesser, even with two new friend requests, research confirms this. They don't know how to respond to death. And because some Facebook friends are dead, they haven't changed their privacy settings. Because from the photos and posts, it's evident. Because some Facebook friends seem closer to each other than you are to them. Because you post and post and wait for comments that never come. You keep coming back to Facebook because when the shit hits the fan, the dog still smiles for the camera. A cat rolls over in stretch. Thanks so much. Uh, that was Carla Schwartz um, reading her poem uh, to the posting Facebook users. And uh, I have to say, I think everybody can probably relate to that, that one. Uh, at least everybody who um, is old enough to still be on Facebook anyway, which includes me. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much for calling in again, Carla. It's, it's always a pleasure. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Take care, Tim. You too. Have a good night. Yep, you too. All right. So um, let's see. We have we have one more uh, pre-recorded poem, which actually I was supposed to do last week, and I skipped right over it. Um, this is from um, the book that we uh, covered last week in the open mic which is um, Alongside We Travel, Contemporary Poets on Autism, edited by Sean Thomas Doherty. And on page six, right early on, is a poem by um, Meredith Bergman called Catching the Eye. And um, Meredith Bergman is a sculptor living in Connecticut. Her chapbook, A Special Education, was published in 2014 by Exot Books, uh, her only child, Daniel, lost the ability to speak when he and was diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder at age three. He learned to think and communicate by spelling at age 12 and discovered literature a few weeks later. He's 22 now, and Meredith and Michael, her uh, husband, drive him to Boston every week so he can study comparative literature and philosophy at Harvard. So uh, here's a poem by Meredith Bergman about uh, autism from this anthology. This is Catching the Eye. It would help if I unmute it. Okay, here we go. Catching the Eye. The Great Hunt, Floor Mosaic, circa 350 AD, Villa Romana del Casale. I read bits of the guidebook to my son, a young man glancing down at the mosaic. Perhaps the cruel story will distress him. It's full of details of a Roman hunt for wild beasts taken for the Colosseum. He looks at art and sees his own condition, predicament, and fate. He sees the cages, the circus animals, the stinking ship, and, lower, how to fool a mother tiger. To steal her cubs away from Africa, you bring a mirrored sphere from Rome and roll it before the frantic beast who grips it thinking her own reflection is her captured cub. And then you ride away with all her young. When little, he'd spend hours in front of glass. He wasn't fascinated just by mirrors, shop windows, or sleek surfaces like pools. Sometimes it was the images beyond. Sometimes he'd search my face quite close and gaze into my eyes. But something was wrong. We call it autism. He wasn't seeing my seeing. I couldn't really catch his eye. And even after I removed my glasses, his ever faithful mirrors, I saw that he was making contact with his fleeting self reflected on the surface of my eyes. But he outgrew this. Has he seen enough? He nods across the hapless animals. Once again, that was Meredith Berkman reading her poem, Catching the Eye, from Alongside We Travel, which was featured, if you, if you want to hear more of that, it's a great book. I uh, would highly recommend reading if you uh, don't have a lot of experience with autism spectrum disorder, because um, really, there, there's, it's hard to imagine a way to see the, the wide variation of the spectrum um, 
without reading a lot of different people's perspectives. It's an amazing thing that poetry can do. Um, so anthologies like this are really incredible. So that was Alongside We Travel from NYQ Books, uh, edited by Sean Thomas Doherty. Um, let's do one more, one last open mic poet. And it's Joshua Corwin, another regular contributor. Um, let's see. I'm calling him up. It's ringing. Um, I'm, let's see. I hear, I hear you, Joshua Corwin. Uh, you're on mute, though, and I don't have your video yet. So as soon as you close uh, YouTube, unmute yourself, and uh, put your video on, and then uh, I'll pull you in. Uh, don't have video yet. Yeah, no rush. <laughs> yeah, we're... Uh... Hang on, hang on one second. I still don't have your video, but I'm going to put your audio on. There is your video. Okay. There you go. Okay. Um, heard, um, so say that again. So, so this is Joshua Corwin, a regular contributor yep. from Los Angeles, California. And you are going to read. i got to get your video small enough. You have the most bandwidth of anybody who calls in. And there's no way to, like, fix it to, to size. Yeah. Uh, I, um... Okay, here we go. There we go. So there's Joshua Corwin. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks so much for calling. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was going to um, read something from my, my book that's going to be coming soon about uh, growing up with autism, addiction, sobriety, and spirituality. But I, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I, you know, you write a new thing and you want to like look at the next thing because this, uh, this is another side project. I've been working on that thing for a while now. Um, but I, uh, yeah, so I, I'm going to read something uh, that uh, is, is new that I've never, you know, read before. Yeah, great, uh, great. I, I know I, I really understand that impulse. I, I want to start writing yeah. poems again. I haven't really written lately, and I'm going to start reading poems too on the open yeah. mic. It's a lot of fun. It'd be something to, um, if you write a poem a week, you're golden. That's kind of how life works. So uh, if, if I, I, could... I write about a poem a day. Well, if you write a poem a day, uh, that's, e that's even better. But a poem would, a week would be good for me. So I'm hoping to uh, maybe do that and then share share my weekly poem during the open mic portion of the show. Um, so so what's this called that you have for us tonight, Joshua? This is um, I, I'm not going to read to you the entire thing. I've been working on an epic, and I'm going to read a segment from an epic I've been working on called "This Godforsaken World." That's been some time, and I've been ins and outs from processes. I've been thinking about this thing. And it's inspired by um, Don Lundy Martin's um, uh, prize-winning uh, book, Good Stock. Uh, uh, Good Stock. Anyways, it, it's her prize-winning book that, uh, that won the Kingsley Tufts Prize recently that I had the honor of hearing, and as well as some um, beat poets. But this is a more upbeat part, and it has a Hasidic... Uh, influence to it um, and there's an epigram that go for part one that goes um, Jacob left Beersheba and he went to Haran and that's 2810 of Genesis man embodied in the radiance of his miss ethereal white light lab coat he doesn't wear it loose, but lets it hang way past the floor into the earth's core. Surgical tools trace dotted lines around a chalkboard of empty space, demarcating a telephone pole to God. Vulcanized smoke emanates from subtle collision of sutures clinking against golden chalice tree bark. Bending the infinite Penrose staircase of willow tree switches. Entangled constellation of form swirls of breaths and pauses. A garden of stars, a garment of galaxies spiraling 
into humanity's wood chipper. Limbs, fallen angelic lepers, wailing denial, laughter upon corrosion. Yet silenced in the echo chamber of the universe, serenity, combustible from conception, is upon us. Descend, descend, hails a voice from the chamber. A wistful penetrates the blissful keep, signifying destruction. Coiled serpent shot through this web of pristine diamonds, their radiant days departing, the reverberating chord of E minor flat lines to white noise. Blinking bombs, cups brimming over assiduous dust, searing through coursing veins of the willow tree, pitting the blackboard against its own reflection of infinity. Oh, man-made culture, sharp, vicious, venomous, as Occam's razor, wreaking havoc, encasing glass, chained wild doves, emblazoned by ire of perplexity, hark, oh, you're blowing me a stormy kiss, cuts the umbilical cord. I cry, God, don't forsake me. Shrapnel skewering the silver thread that tethered my spirit to yours. My prostrated pulse, just seated repentance, beseeching for unwavering forgiveness, but gripped by reflective isolation, reminiscence ignited by bomb whose name demonstrated doom upon non-existence, combustion personified in this mirror conception. Oh, I awaken as light twinkles, raven form shapes flickering in and out, as though I had experienced lightning. Shrapnel in my red liquored locust, taking my first <sighs> breath. Shrapnel and you, and you, you man, have skewered your godly image to pieces. And along with me, you have skewered yourselves into a peace time, ticking a clock on the wall in the hospital hall where I am born into this godforsaken world. Joshua Corwin, thank thanks you. so much. It was a good reading, too. Yeah, a lot, thanks. A lot of, a lot of you know, uh, like a, a drama prize for that that performance <laughs> from your couch. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for calling again, and I uh, hope to see you soon. I'm sure I will. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Have a good night. Yeah. So that was Joshua Corwin on the uh, on the open mic. Um, if you'd like to call in, there's still. Uh, I, I tried to wrap this up about uh, seven thirty my time, which is uh, the time my kids go to bed. I like to. Uh, you know, do the whole story time and all that stuff. I don't want to miss out. But I have five minutes left if anybody would still like to call in. Uh, once again, the number is um, 818-850-7727. Or you can send a chat message really quick to uh, Rattle Poetry. And uh, I will reply and then call you back really quick. Um, so if that's all for tonight, then I uh, hope everybody out there has a wonderful holiday. Uh, whichever holiday you celebrate. And um, we will see you back again. Um, pull this up. We'll see you back again January 7th. That's a Tuesday, of course, at 9 o'clock. And we're not doing the pre-show once again. So um, we'll start with uh, Barbara Crooker uh, around 6.10. But I'll do a couple, a poem or two to, in the beginning like we do. And... Um, and um, then we'll bring in Barbara. So, uh, so I'll see you there, January seventh, and um, that's 2020, a year that sounds like something from a science fiction movie. But I will see you in 2020. If you're still watching, please do click the like button if you haven't yet. That's always helpful because that's how um, things show up in the uh, watch next line on YouTube. But uh, in the meantime, have a great night. Thanks so much for joining us again, and uh, I'll see you soon. Bye.